Welcome back to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. My name is Sonny Bunch, culture editor at The Bulwark, and I'm very pleased to be rejoined by Julia Alexander. Had her on the show before. Uh, she's with Parrot Analytics. She writes a weekly newsletter for Puck. Is uh, one of the most uh, smart and entertaining and informative people out there on uh, the world of streaming data. It's, uh, it's, it's Julia and the entertainment strategy guy. One and one A on my my list. They're they're battling it to the death. But <laughs> since she does my show, she's number one right now. So if you're listening out there, ESG, you got it. You got to get it together. Uh, thanks for being on the show, Julia. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Always an honor to join. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, a couple things. We're we're going to talk about Disney's earnings call uh, here in a couple minutes. Um, but the first thing I wanted to discuss with you was something you wrote about uh, last week, which is that. And something I found very surprising, I guess it probably shouldn't be that surprising, because Seinfeld is one of the most popular sitcoms in the history of television. Hugely popular. Back in the day, huge hit on syndication. Uh, and so it shouldn't really be a shock that Netflix uh, has has a hit on its hand with Seinfeld. But there was one thing I was kind of surprised by, was that it's not just a hit. It is, it is a hit with... It's a reason people stay with the service... Um, and it's a hit with younger audiences. I, I think I think the number was forty one percent or something like that uh, of viewers of Seinfeld are under the age of thirty five on Netflix. Um, so let's talk about that. What what does Netflix have on its hand with Seinfeld? What are what are they doing there? Bluntly, they have something they need, which is a type of comedy that encourages repeat viewing. <clears throat> the term I use for this a lot is snackable content. So if we think of dramas, you don't get a lot of dramas that people rewatch over and over again. Some of the ones that come to mind that where that does happen are like The Sopranos. Like people tend to rewatch The Sopranos um, almost annually. But comedies are repeat viewing engagement. It is the type of thing that people put on before they go to bed. It's the thing people put on when they're sad or they're sick, um, when they're cooking. And so what that does is increases the perceived value of a service because it's what you're engaging with over and over again. So other titles like Seinfeld that would be included in this would be stuff like New Girl. Um, it would be stuff like The Office, which went to Peacock, stuff like Friends, which went to HBO Max. And unsurprisingly, if we think about that kind of type of sitcom, right, it's a very specific type of broadcast sitcom that we're talking about. Um, those, if we think about Friends in the Office, those were Netflix's two best performing shows for years. And then they left because of that reason. They went to Peacock and HBO Max. So with Seinfeld, the goal with Netflix was always to replace that. It was always to find something that people would come back to over and over again and that would register on some of their most watched stuff and that would register amongst um, people who were potentially looking to cancel Netflix. And that was the reason they were staying. And what my research has shown is that that's happened, is that the value of that title to Netflix is extraordinary because it is one of the few comedies that Netflix has that's long running, so more than four seasons, um, that people kind of put on over and over again and, and rewatch. And so the reason I say it's exactly what Netflix needs is because they've tried for years to create a comedy of a similar vein. They've tried with Grace and Frankie, which is, you know, a great show. They tried with The Ranch from Chuck Lorre. Uh, they've tried with a bunch of other things to kind of recreate this almost broadcasty style sitcom that gets people to engage and they really haven't succeeded with it. The closest comedies they have that have done really well for them in terms of longevity are dramedies, right? It's kind of Orange is the New Black, more drama than comedy, one would argue. Um, they don't really have this. And so the goal with Seinfeld was to prove that there was an audience that would watch comedies over and over again on Netflix if it was available to them. And that's what they found. And, and they're finding it to your point about what we were in the art in the article I wrote, they're finding it within a large cohort of audiences that would have potentially um, uh, canceled their service, which Netflix refers to as high risk churn. It's a type of customer that is far more valuable than those that are constantly engaged with the service because they're not worried about losing them. So the fact that Seinfeld is finding that engagement, which is great, and it's finding engagement amongst those that were going to cancel, makes that show especially valuable for Netflix. Uh. There's something you said uh, 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 right at the beginning of that that jumped out at me because I'm 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 fascinated here. A, a thing I have been fascinated by in the world of television for a long time is what is going to is there ever is there ever going to be a replacement for the syndication model? Basically, is my is my so like I I have a theory that the sitcom is basically a, a an endangered format at least as we understand it because. 
the whole model of the sitcom was one out of every 10 that you make goes to syndication and makes somebody a billion dollars, you know, or one out of every 20 or one out of every whatever. But there's there's like a huge home run potential for these shows. Um, and obviously Netflix has that inside. So Seinfeld is that Friends is that, you know, the ones we mentioned Big Bang Theory is that. Um, but you you have it's hard to make that sort of thing in the world of streaming, right? I mean, has there been any streaming native show that has performed in that sort of manner? No, bluntly, no. And to your exact for, for sitcoms point. specifically, I'm sorry, specifically for sitcoms because I feel like Stranger Things that's that's right. a different world, but like, but right, and even like comedies broadly, right? Like even comedies, you have to kind of separate into its own little barrels, and like there have been successful comedy shows on streaming services but not like sitcom style things that we're used to and to your to your exact point we were just saying earlier they made 20 of these shows it was pilot season right they'd go out and then they'd maybe have one they'd have maybe five that last longer than two seasons and one that kind of goes 10 seasons and they're syndicating and it's making money and it's great and they do a spinoff like young sheldon right that kind of happens or joey for one season um what happened with streaming was the economics changed. The, the, the economics that allowed for that type of show to work on broadcast was that as long as it reached a certain amount of viewers and it had to have viewers in a certain demographic, the advertisers were happy. And as long as the advertisers were happy, they could pay for the show. And so they would do things like if you talk to uh, any of the producers on Modern Family, if you just listen to what they say, they worked a lot with advertisers, same as Blackish. They were kind of like Blackish wants to, you know, the uh, Toyota wants to do uh, a whole thing in Blackish. And so they worked that way, that joke in, right? So it was like, great the economics of what broadcast and advertising was allowed those shows to find funding and allowed those shows to find an audience and a specific audience to keep going to get to the five season hundred episode mark and then start syndicating what we didn't see in streaming for a long time was this because if we think about it the idea of streaming as a competitive sphere is still relatively new, right? It's like three years old, the idea of actual competition. Netflix could say for a very long time they weren't going to do ads because they were operating from a, t- a place of total and absolute monopol- uh, monopolization. They could say we're not going to do ads because we're the only streaming service out there. So therefore, we're the only thing that can really grow. Then all of a sudden you have competition, it's a fair marketplace. These are things that we celebrate in healthy democracy. Uh, all of a sudden, Netflix is now losing customers to, to kind of to competition. The revenue is drying up. All these things are happening. So Netflix goes, we're going to bring ads in. And one of the benefits to bringing advertisers in is that advertisers like certain types of shows. They like sitcoms. They like procedurals. These are the type of series that Netflix couldn't necessarily make because the way that their efficiency metric worked was that a certain show had to have a certain completion rate. It had to have a certain referral value. So that means that if you watch Stranger Things and then you watch Bridgerton, that had a significant referral point versus if you watch Stranger Things and then watch Criminal Minds or NCIS. That was less of a point, but it was still a point. And if you watch Stranger Things and nothing else, then you got no referral value. All these different metrics add up in a kind of an Excel sheet and it creates an efficiency rating. And that's how Netflix kind of views, is this a success or not? Is this something that we want to invest in alongside like creative development? Although I would argue it's kind of less on that end, a lot of data focus. And I'll give you another example of how we know that sitcoms haven't really worked in streaming in terms of being able to acquire subscribers, which is the goal for a lot of these new streamers, is Peacock, right? Peacock teamed up with Tina Fey and, and um, Mike uh, Mike Schur. I mean, these are gods amongst the comedy scene, right? 30 Rock, The Office, um, The Good Place, all those types of shows. And they couldn't bring in Girls 5 Eva is a show that got canceled after two seasons on Peacock and is going to Netflix. Rutherford Falls got canceled. These are the types of shows that they couldn't get people in the door to watch. Comedy as a whole, the, the, what makes those types of comedies valuable is that they are what keep people from canceling. So if you're in Netflix and your biggest concern right now is churn in your biggest market, your biggest concern is how do we bring people, how do we keep them, how, sorry, how do we keep them there? Comedies. That's why you see them making deals for things like Girls 5 Eva. It's why Seinfeld's so important. But they couldn't actually, prior to dealing with advertisers, uh, or bringing in advertisers rather, and prior to kind of making these deals for sitcoms that they think can work on their bigger platform, it's like the manifest type effect, you weren't seeing a lot of comedies coming out of Netflix because the economics just never made sense for it. Let me ask. I, I mean, this this seems like confirmation of the idea that Netflix is essentially the the uh, I don't, the 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 next version of broadcast, right? Because way, the way I understand what you're saying is a sitcom type show 
is great if you already have a built-in customer base. If you already have the 100 million people who are there and are just looking for something to watch, a sitcom can work for you. Yeah. But if you're like, if you're a Peacock or, you know, or Paramount Plus or whatever, nobody is signing up for those networks to watch, like, the new Tina Fey show. Mm-hmm. Um is that is that basically is that is that more or less how how you've seen it shake out? Yeah, from a data perspective, that's true. And there's always, I mean, um, I'm sure e- ESG will appreciate this, but there's always outliers, right? So there's always something where you're like, oh, well, this is working. Like this this thing just works, and it's found its audience, and it's it's doing what it needs to do, and that's great in terms of a customer acquisition perspective. But when we kind of look at comedies as a whole. Um, if we think about how, you know, human behavior, right? If we just get to that, if we think about how broadcast used to work, you sit down with your remote and you go through and you might put something on. And if we think about how people programmed, right? The programming teams figured out how to do those blocks. You might watch NBC for ER and then they've got friends coming on or they've got something for Thursday and they're programming for that. They're like, here's your drama, here's your sitcom. And then you figure out how they're going to put it all together um, and to kind of get people to watch the channel for as long as they can because their biggest concern is programming for the next two hours and keeping that engagement high. With streaming, the whole question is how do you get people in the door? That tends to be dramas. It, 99% of the time it tends to be big dramas, whether they're sci-fi, fantasy, uh, thriller, whatever it might be. That's what gets people in. But then when people are done, especially with Netflix when they're binging, wh- what keeps them there? Sometimes it's movies. We see a lot of people kind of return to watch movies over and over again or, and, and just watch films in general. A lot of the time, it is licensed content that is comedies or procedurals because they're done with the the Stranger Things, they're done with the Bridgerton or whatever, and now they want to go and watch something that they're going to laugh at, something that's going to kind of chill them out, something that they're going to put on before bed. Um, there's a term for this, and it's called contextual recommendations. If we think about how algorithms work right now, if you were to watch The Handmaid's Tale on Hulu, the next thing that Hulu would recommend would be something similar to The Handmaid's Tale. I think we talked about this the last time I was here. And the issue with that is that most people, when they watch The Handmaid's Tale, do not want to watch something similar to The Handmaid's Tale afterwards. They're, they're done with it. They don't want to watch anything related to it. They want to watch something like a Rick and Morty, like The Office. They want to watch something that's completely different and it's kind of a palate cleanser. And so if we think about streaming services, the comedies are there to kind of not just supplement the dramas, but they're there to really make that value of the package. And the package, you know, is that streaming service of all that content really, really uh, enticing. And so if they, if the big thing that people are coming in for is the House of the Dragon, the thing that they're watching afterwards is the Friends, the Big Bang Theory, the South Park. That's what kind of keeps them engaged. And they're like, oh, well, my favorite show is here, or I can rewatch this, or I can laugh, and it's awesome. Sometimes you get shows like Our Flag Means Death, and people want to check it out, and so they go check it out, and it's a comedy, and it's kind of, you know, on the cusp of doing some cool stuff, and that's the type of title that might bring subscribers in. But more often than not, the comedy is what people find, ideally through contextual recommendations, that feel broadcasty, right? That feel like, okay, I'm recommending this comedy to you after you watch this thing and we want to keep you engaged with it. Going back to my earlier point, the issue with creating those types of comedies, those long running comedies, is that the audience, first of all, had to be aware of them. And with algorithmic recommendations, they might not be. Discovery is a whole issue. And two, it's difficult to make those shows even if they're a little bit cheaper if there's no data supporting that it's doing what it's got to be doing when you buy a Seinfeld it's a show that people know it's a show that gets recommended because it touches just enough different interests that people are seeing on their page and it's a show that people can watch over and over and over again Um, it's also a show and this is really important as well we don't talk about it enough it's a show that is still highly memeable on both YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and all the and Twitter. And it's the type of thing where people are hyper aware of it. And so that cultural cachet tied into the easy accessibility and availability of it being on Netflix makes people who are younger seek it out. They finally start watching it. It makes older people rewatch it and they're kind of going back to it. So the fact that it's kind of constant in the culture still makes that more valuable than trying to create something that is a cultural zeitgeist that is insanely difficult now more than ever. When you uh when you survey people about how they watch these shows do you find that uh for like a a seinfeld for example um are they sitting down and just like turning on all right i'm gonna watch season two and i'm gonna let it play or are they going for specific episodes are they sitting down like i want to watch the soup nazi episode or i want to watch you know whatever else I'm, i'm just curious how they actually how they actually do it if it's like a modern streaming we're just going to sit down and let the thing play and go through it or if it's more like like a self-curated syndication like i want to watch this 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 and this 
I think that's the a very very interesting and important question, right? It is, and I and from what from the what our research shows, it's kind of they're sitting down, they're watching it. Mo- majority, they're sitting down, they're watching, they're letting it play. Um, I think what you get a lot of is people who, again, are cleaning and they put on the background are. De- decompressing and so they kind of just put something on it's where that shuffle button actually really comes into play it's like i don't want to think about it i just you put on an episode it's great um i do think there is a segment of audience that we can see that i always call the i think you should leave now audience if you talk to fans of i think you should leave now they go in for a specific sketch they're like i'm talking about a sketch i want to watch that sketch and then they kind of go back and forth they like exit out then they'll go to another sketch they don't typically watch it through the whole way again uh with groups of friends or whatever it might be versus the the sitcoms traditional sitcoms it is still people kind of just turning it on re-watching season after season after season or just putting on a block of episodes that they're really into so they might be into an arc they want to watch the rachel and ross arc or they they want to watch uh you know specific like specific kramer type episodes which is again where that curation really comes into play because once you have people seeking out these types of shows the nice thing about sitcoms and the nice thing about broadcast, the way that they, if we think about also, uh, to your point about syndication, when you would watch rebroadcast these types of shows and reruns, you didn't think about it. You put it on, it was like, great, I'm either going to like this episode and I've seen it a bunch, or I'm not going to like the episode and I don't, and it, whatever, I'll just go to something else. With Netflix or Peacock or HBO Max or whatever it might be, that option isn't really there as much. You're, you're choosing what you're getting unless you hit the shuffle button. And I think that's where this curation really comes into play because people, when they're, I in my from my, my understanding from my research, when people are fi- looking for these sitcoms, they're just looking to decompress. They're just looking for something they can put on and they're immediately feeling better. It feels familiar. Unless they're watching it for the first time, like a lot of Gen Z are, they're kind of like, I don't care what this is. And it, that's where you see the difference in streamers where you have a Peacock or an HBO Max that curates like collections. And they're like, you want to watch the Kramer episodes, you want to watch Elaine episodes, whatever they might be. Like, we're going to make sure that we have this packaged up for you. It's eight episodes. You can go in, hit play, and we'll just go through them. Netflix doesn't do this as well. They kind of have their rows, but it's not curated. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. And so when you're going in, you're hitting the shuffle button or you're just clicking on a season and hitting an episode and be like, okay, I guess we'll go from here. We don't typically see people sit down, and hit season one, play episode one, like, and they're starting from the get-go unless they're doing a rewatch. It is kind of more on the lines of like, oh, well, I have an episode in mind and I'll let that play out across different episodes. Um, but it's not like they're jumping back and forth between episodes the way that you would see with like Sketch. Can you see uh, what the sort of... So we, 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 you have a sense of the age of the audience. Right. Um, do, do you have a sense of who is watching a show like Seinfeld for the first time versus who is who is watching it because they – like I, I grew up watching it, right? right. Or I, I watched it on syndication. I watched it on, you know, Fox 5 at 5 p.m. for six years. Like, you know, I like – but you don't you don't have a sense of that. We don't. Yeah, I don't have a sense of that. I mean, Netflix would for sure. I'm sure Netflix. Would. Yeah, but um, we the way the way that we look at data and then surveys that I do, it's um not as substantial as what we would need to then like say yes, this is what most people are doing within this age group. If I had to put money on it, I'm I would put money on Gen Z younger millennials watching for the first time or re-watching like from the beginning and i would put older audiences kind of going in episode like to the episode they want and then letting things play um but i have no real data to back that up that would just be in- in- intuition yeah okay cool um uh one one other minor thing that was kind of interesting uh peacock mm-hmm. picking up their hallmark vertical yes. um you 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 were very high on this you you think this is a big why is this a, a big win for for peacock i think if you asked any average consumer who's slightly in the know about streaming services and asked them to define what the streaming services were it's Peacock and Paramount Plus are the most difficult to answer. It's the most difficult to be like, here's why I need this streaming service. Like, here's what they do versus Disney's very easy. Netflix is easy. HBO Max is very easy. And so with Peacock, the issue I always had with their strategy was that they kept trying to replicate what the others were kind of doing. So they were like, we're going to have a show like Bel Air. We're going to have these big, uh, like Dr. Death. We're going to have these big prestigious premium type shows that are comparable to HBO and Showtime and FX and and even Apple TV Plus to an extent. And my argument was always that is not who your audience is. You're not who your subscriber base is. If most 
U.S. households, according to latest research, are going to have three and a half streaming services in terms of video entertainment in their homes that they're paying for. We accept the fact that one is Disney, one is Netflix. At this point, it seems, it seems most likely you've got one streaming service left that people might go for. Who Peacock is going after, that audience is already signing up for HBO Max, they're already signing up for Apple TV Plus, and they're watching Amazon Prime Video. So what is Peacock? Peacock is, to me, the audience has always been cable cutters who are slightly older who want to replicate cable at the cheapest format that they can. And the only two companies that can do that pretty well are Paramount and uh, NBC Universal Comcast because of their libraries, because of the fact that they own um, next day rights for streaming. They can actually kind of do that with sports and news. And so when Hallmark started coming up, I was like, yes, that is that is who your audience is. If we take the most basic assumption of the Peacock audience, which is, and this is totally gender stereotypical, but, you know, dad likes football, mom likes Real Housewives, kids want to watch Jurassic World or whatever movie or whatever, you know, kids content is happening over there. Having the Hallmark channel, especially going into the holidays, is the type of content that people, one, are going to sign up for and two, keep hyper engaged with. It is it is it is Bravo but times 10. And so for Peacock, when they're trying to identify what their brand is, when they're trying to say, here's what makes us different, latching on to that audience who's going, I like Hallmark movies. I got that with cable and I no longer have that with my cable or I'm looking for a better way to do this is the easiest way to engage with that audience in the most effective way. The Hallmark thing is interesting because it, it you know, I, I am not as skeptical as some people are of the HBO Warner uh, Discovery merger, I feel like that makes sense mm-hmm. in the same way that I think Hulu and Disney Plus and ESPN Plus all coming together makes sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I feel like we're we're headed towards a great merging uh, and and that will be best for everybody involved. Maybe one day they can get all of these things to us via underground cables of some sort and we'll just get them right to our TV. It'll be it'll be wonderful. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but anyway, I, I digress. Uh, so the big, the big news uh, from yesterday was the Disney earnings call. Um, uh, I, there, I, I don't understand. I don't understand math. I'm not a math person. So I was very confused when I saw that Disney plus has 12.1 million new subscribers, uh, and still managed to generate $200 million less in revenue Mm -hmm. from their direct to consumer. How does that how does that math work? Is this is this a function of like Indian subs? Is it like what is what's going on here? The average revenue per user, which is ARPU in industry slang, uh, dropped across the board. So it dropped in every major market, which means that as much as Disney was adding subscribers, it was losing the amount. It was losing money on all the subscribers that was kind of, that were coming in, and the, also the amount of subscribers they have. Part of that is from increased churn in certain markets. Part of that is um, from discounts that are kind of coming into play. And so when you look at that basic math of you might add this many customers, but if you're only making this much money on the customers coming in, you can actually still lose money. Uh, That's partially what hit their revenue. And then also their operational costs greatly grew. So it was not that they just missed on the top line, they missed on the bottom line. They, They not only brought in less revenue than the quarter before, they also brought in, they also had higher expenses than the quarter before and the year before. And so that's been the big issue with Wall Street. When they're looking at the subscriber count, the thing that happened three quarters ago was that Wall Street stopped caring about subscriber growth. They were like, originally, for the last six years, that's been their only concern. Are you growing subscribers or people coming in? In the last three quarters, they suddenly went, yeah, but are you making money on these subscribers? And none of the streaming services other than Netflix are profitable. None of them. Disney is the closest. They're supposed to be profitable by end of uh, Q4 or, or yeah, end of Q4 next year. Um, and they're saying, we'll then break even and we'll start making a profit. But the issue that the street has, which is why their stock is the lowest that it's been in 20 years, is that they don't know because they don't know if Disney's going to get those operational costs under control. And the thing about Disney is as a company, you could look at Disney and say, cool, you're going to spend money on Disney, uh, excuse me, on Disney Plus and, D- and direct-to-consumer, and we know that it's going to take some money, some investment, and that's okay, because you could rely on parks and you could rely on media networks. Remember, media networks is one of its biggest, biggest, biggest revenue drivers, and that's like ESPN. That's like all the all the broadcast stuff. Well, in that call, you have Christine McCarthy, who's the CFO, the chief financial officer, going, 
we expect accelerated cord cutting, which anyone would have said any, like, of course we can, we can see that people are getting rid of cable. Um, two, we expect pretty big slowdowns in advertising on television because of inflation and the, hang the recession hanging over our heads. Three, it, we're at our peak cost. So we're hoping that operation cost for direct to consumer goes down, but we're not sure. Four, parks in Shanghai have closed. We don't know what's gonna happen in Florida because of hurricanes. We don't know if COVID, uh, it might cause other shutdowns in China long-term, Japan long-term. And so all of a sudden, everything becomes this perfect hurricane of like potential concerns. It is like Disney's lose, not losing money on media networks, but is slowing down. Direct and consumer, direct -to consumer is getting more expensive and the average revenue per user is dropping. And we are seeing, we're about to see them introduce a $3 price hike. I don't think they'll have a huge churn rate in terms of people canceling, but they will see some churn. Um, three, something that doesn't get talked about enough with direct to consumer and Disney, they're running out of countries to launch in. So when they add all these numbers every quarter, every two quarters, there's always like they added, you know, five million more than than Wall Street expected. Part of the thing I always point to is like they launched in nine countries. So they have a built in number of subscribers they were going to add regardless. If you look at a Netflix, they're out of room to roll out. In. They, they're in every country they're going to be in. And so Netflix, when they go, we add two million subscribers, it's actually a big deal because you're like, they found customers and the, the way that I think there was a, some shock in the United States when Amazon announced that they added more customers in the US for Prime Video um, for Thursday Night Football than they had like over, you know, compared to Black Friday or anything else. And everyone was like, didn't know there were more customers in the United States that were not using Amazon and were now signing up for Amazon. It's this thing happening with Netflix where you're like, oh, they added 3 million subscribers. I didn't know there were people to still add Netflix because they're in every country. Um, with Disney, Disney Plus is hit, gonna hit a point where they'll roll out in every country that they're gonna roll out into. And so then it's like, okay, well, what does your growth rate look there? And what does your revenue on that growth rate look like? So all these things are happening. This is kind of explains how we got here. My quick thing before, before um, I, I hand it back over to you is it is such a like, typical Wall Street move where the earnings were not that bad. This was not like a cataclysmic report. This was like Disney mm -hmm. coming out and saying, hey, things are slowing down, but also we've hit the highest level that we think of operation costs. We're bringing ads in next month. So our re average revenue per user is going to jump. It's gonna be pretty, much, it's gonna be much higher than what it has been. Uh, so things are looking pretty good. We still expect, even with the economic macro headwinds as they are, we still expect that we're gonna be profitable this time next year. And Wall Street lost its mind. Jim Cramer's on CNBC calling for Bill, uh, Bob Chapek's head. Like it's, a, one of those moments where you're kind of like, I don't understand the reaction to it. It was not a great earnings. It was not a terrible earnings. It was kind of like, yeah, this is what, this is kind of what we were expecting. And I think what you're seeing is Disney is the last big company within this kind of media and entertainment um, sector that's in streaming. And Wall Street is kind of like, crap. Like, like, like everything now is like, what does this look like for all of these companies? Yeah, I, I didn't understand the stock drop either to the extent that if I, you know, wasn't horribly conflicted, I probably would have picked up some Disney stock myself because that like, yeah, it's super cheap right now. People, should, I, I, I'm not giving <laughs> for record, not investment <laughs> advice. Um, but, you know, uh, but I want to I want to ask one question about a, a thing that you had mentioned very briefly, Prime Video. So when I, I remember seeing that that. Uh, that announcement by Amazon as well that they the more most signups you know that they mm -hmm. that they had seen over a whatever twenty four hour stretch or whatever whatever the number was was it specifically was it actual signups for Amazon Prime or was it activations of Prime Video it was uh, Prime it was because they because they compared it to Black Friday uh, and and okay all, so it's like Monday. people actually signing up for the for the you know a hundred whatever Prime is now, $150 a year or whatever. Right. It was like people signing up for, oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's why that's a, it was crazy. Cause I was like, I didn't, at this point, I assumed if you lived in the States, <laughs> if you hadn't had Amazon by now, you are probably like against having it. You were like, I don't right. want to support Jeff Bezos or whatever. Actively, yeah. actively opposed <laughs> yeah, to Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to just you know, uh, can I? Uh, I, I want to. I want to run a theory by you. Uh, let me know if this is this is dumb or doesn't make any sense. Hocus Pocus Two mm. is an enormous hit for Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. My theory is that Hocus Pocus Two is the Adam Sandler equivalent. 
before Disney Plus. <laughs> like not you know you like you know how Adam Sandler's making movies for Netflix and they're movies that people aren't necessarily going to go see in a theater, but everybody likes Adam Sandler so they watch them because they're on Netflix and you got that is what I kind of assume Hocus Pocus 2 is. Do you have any idea is is that do you think that's far off or I, I wrote, or did Disney leave money on the table? I, yeah, so it's funny cuz I have different opinions and uh, very very smart people in the space Scott Mendelson who's over at the Rap now and ESG who I think I think is kind of sides with Scott on this. I'm on your side. I wrote a piece or puck about this. I said Hocus Pocus 2 is the quintessential streaming movie. I was like this is also, the thing that people forget about Disney is that they are, they're, or they don't forget it, but when they think of their theatrical business, it is global. It is a fully global business. They rarely launch something um, here that they wouldn't launch overseas. And the only times they do, so, and it's the opposite, actually. The only times that they put stuff on um, Disney Plus here and release theatrically globally is if Disney Plus is not available. Like, And they're like, okay, we'll put this in theaters. Um so when we look at Hocus Pocus 2, there's a huge nostalgia factor to this, right? It's people who want to watch it, and then it, people who are a little bit older might have young kids. It becomes this family event that you can type, you can do. Nostalgia does not travel for that movie outside of the United States, and Disney executives know that. Um, people who cover the space know that. And so we look at Hocus Pocus 2. One, that movie was never going to be successful in theaters globally by any means. Two, to your exact point... When we talk about theaters, and this is such a conversation, right? And I say this, and I know that you feel the same way. I say this to someone who goes to theaters. I like theaters. Going to a movie theater now with higher inflation uh, requires, there's especially for the average consumer uh, who might have a family of like four and they're spending 80 bucks at the theater, 90 bucks at the theater, um, requires this kind of promise of something. There needs to be this promise of like an Avatar 2, you know, Wakanda type situation. It doesn't have to be just superheroes, but you know kind of what makes horror movies really work we've talked this whole year about why horror movies are working and it's like if you think about what makes a theatrical movie work right now it is spectacle that needs to be experienced with community or audience live and that needs to be experienced kind of opening weekend right this thing of like i have to go watch it i have to go watch it now and i have to go watch it in a theater because i can't do what i can do at home hocus pocus 2 the value perception of that movie is I'm going to have friends over and put Hocus Pocus on because I'm paying for Disney Plus or I'm going to open Disney Plus up and I'm going to watch it because it's available to me in my mind for free, even though you're paying monthly for it. In my mind, that's a free movie that I can watch. For Disney, and this is what I think gets left out of the conversation, this movie and the headlines, the Nielsen numbers generated and what Disney kind of put out right before the advertising tier rolls in is like people are engaging with our platform and that movie, they will people will rewatch over Halloween weekend. They can watch in the weekends leading up to Halloween. All of a sudden, Disney Plus, right before a price hike and the ad tier comes in, suddenly you're like, I can't live without Disney Plus. Look how much, look how much I've been using it, right? That movie... The value it generates for Disney Plus and DTC is more valuable than the potential $20 million in found money that happens in theaters. And that's if people go to theaters. And I think to your point and kind of what I was getting to with um, the the experience you're promised, Hocus Pocus 2 does not come with it. It doesn't even necessarily have the same type of experience that you get if you put... Um, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas back in theaters and you get a lot of former emo kids who go out together and they all sing it you know it's like there's an experience where they're going out and they're having this Hocus Pocus 2 doesn't have that and so why would Disney especially with their research kind of showing this put out a movie in theaters deal with potentially bad press on it uh, with that headline of like here's what it did in theaters um, have to go through the all the trouble of figuring out what that back uh um what the pay looks like to talent when they're when they're figuring out what that looks like in terms of box office instead they can go we're gonna put this on streaming we know it's gonna be a pretty decent hit on streaming um we know that we can figure this all out and it's gonna help our our direct to consumer business at a time when we really need it to everything about that movie i think your adam sandler comparison is spot on is exactly that it is like i don't want to spend money on this but in my head it is free because i'm paying for it already and it's there yeah yeah, no, I mean, I I, I, I think I, I tweeted something to this effect, but, like, normally I would yell at Disney, and I would say, you are leaving money on the table, you're killing theaters, stop it, stop it. But, like, I don't think this is, a, I don't think it's a theater movie. I just, and, you know, maybe that's my own bias because I'm not a Hocus Pocus fan. No, I think uh, I think so. you're right, and I, and I put this in the piece, too, because it's funny. I, I think, and all the data shows, that 
I 95% of movies should go to theaters. At least, especially when, if the, when I was looking to the research on this, when I think this thing was like 96% of movies made 98 plus percent of its revenue within 30 to 40 days. So the, the, mm-hmm. if you're in theaters for 30 days, that's how much you're going to make on that movie anyways. And so now that they have basically the exhibitors on their knees and they can say, you know, to AMC and to Regal or whoever, that we're only going to be in theaters for 35 days and then we're going to bring it to Disney Plus and, or HBO Max or whatever. And you can see that bump. We see it all the time. There's a bigger bump on movies that come to streaming platforms after they're in theaters. 95% of movies should be in theaters. Go and do it. Like, it, it just makes business sense. These types of movies, and and I th- again, I really like your Adam Sandler comparison. Like, that type of movie, like the Hocus Pocuses, there's, like, certain films where you're like, I, I'm not going to pay to see that. I don't know many people who would pay to see that. But that is the type of movie that a bunch of people in their 20s and 30s are going to have drinks over. And they're going to make a huge little thing about it. We're going to have a Hocus Pocus night. And all of a sudden, it's like, wow, what a great moment. People sign up for Disney Plus to kind of do it because in their mind, it's a movie that's worth $8. Like, sure, I'll pay eight bucks and I get this and I can cancel it 30 days later. That's still cheaper than going to see it in theaters and wrangling my friends to try to figure out when everyone can go. And if you're, if you've got kids, those kids will watch it over and over again. Everyone I talked to whose kids watched Tokus Pocus 2 for the first time, like, watched it again and again. And so for Disney, it's like the quintessential win, and that is the quintessential streaming movie at a time when I also argue in the, this in the puck piece that Disney is the most experimental. If, if, if we have a line of executives on this end, is on the far right is Ted Sarandos going at Netflix going, we don't need to put movies in theaters. We can build franchises. The Gray Man is going to be the next big film franchise. On the far left is um, uh, David Zaslav, who says there's no reason we should ever send a movie to streaming services anymore. It should just go to theaters. In the middle, you kind of got a Jeff Shell at NBC Universal who's like, most movies should go to theaters, but we're going to do like day and date for Halloween ends. We think we're going to experiment. Chapek is the most like, let's experiment. Like, let's see what happens if we took this year and we do this year and let's get more data to understand where we're going with it. Most of those films should go to theaters. And I think he's made mistakes on other titles. This one, I was like, if they had put in theaters, I think would have been the bigger mistake. I think they made the right move. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, movies like turning red or you know probably probably should have gotten a a uh at least limited theatrical run all right let's one more one more netflix thing uh here you know um uh, for a long time people thought uh ryan murphy uh the guy behind glee and uh nip tuck uh amongst other amongst other shows um he he was signed to a massive nine-figure deal uh by by netflix they they wanted him to make hit shows for them and the first five or six of those shows were not hit shows they were i mean they were watched but but now he has two in a row that are pretty big pretty pretty big i mean Dahmer is enormous mm-hmm. Dahmer is 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 a very big hit um uh and the watcher i think is also is also doing very well what what is your read on the Do- uh, on the on the fallout from Dahmer. I mean, is does this does this prove Netflix was right to sign him to the thing? Will they sign him again? What is it is it the sort of thing that is franchisable mm. like American Horror Story? Mm. I mean, is it is it the sort of thing they can build on? Um or is it just like, well, they they finally got lucky with this this big deal they signed. I think I also love that you brought up Nip Tuck, which is one of my I love that show. Um and and you didn't bring up The Prom, which was maybe the movie that cost Netflix quite a bit of money uh, that Ryan Murphy did. Well, that yeah. um <laughs> that was part of his deal. Um the 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 easy answer and the simple answer is like no, Ryan Murphy is not worth what they spent on, which I think was about 300 million dollars. What he produced up until Dahmer would come would generate nowhere close to that amount of value. Dahmer would. Dahmer by itself hits a 300 million. So you could argue that okay, Dahmer by itself is worth the deal that they paid for Ryan Murphy. Except that they still overpaid for what they got from him. What I think they'll do going forward is what they should do is Ryan Murphy makes one-off projects for Netflix and they say, cool, we'll be in a bidding war with most likely Disney. Like we will bid against John Landgraf at FX to get your next project and then we'll bring you here if we think it's going to do what it's going to do. In to, to, in, because that's what I think is going to happen with all the major showrunner deals. With all the major showrunner deals that have kind of happened, most of them have not really panned out. Even J.J. Abrams over at uh, HBO Max has not really panned out and then he's kind of I think going to Apple um, you've got you know Shonda 
is like the only one that's maybe panning out, and that's basically just kind of on Bridgerton and uh, Inventing Anna. We'll see what kind of happens next. The the issue with trying to standardize talent is you can't standardize creativity. You can't be like, okay, we're going to put this much money in and therefore we need you to produce this amount of stuff. The overall deal, which is not going away, I think the overall deal stays, but the mega overall deal goes away. The overall deal was always just a way to say we believe in you as talent. We like you. We want you to make stuff for us and we prefer if you did it here and not somewhere else. And so we're going to kind of sign you to this and we'll guarantee projects. But it was never like we're going to give you $500 million and then we're going to see how this goes because vast majority of creatives over a five-year period are not going to create multiple projects that generate the kind of buzz and uh, and um, viewership that Dahmer does. Like, it's just not going to happen. Um, even the the Duffer brothers have made one show and it's done very well for them on Netflix. But the idea that the Dahmer brothers, the Dahmer brothers, the Duffer brothers, oh the my Dahmer God. The Dahmer brothers. The Duffer That should be... <laughs> <laughs> that should be a show on Netflix. <laughs> um, created by the Duffer Brothers. But uh, the, the idea that the Duffer Brothers are going to come out and make another Stranger Things feels very unlikely. In the same way that the Game of Thrones guys, the idea that they're going to make another Game of Thrones feels very unlikely. That's just how creativity works. And I think we try to standardize it in, at that level of pay. It doesn't make sense. You want to make an overall deal for $50 million. And you're like, hey, like that makes more sense to me. To your other question, which I think is the, the biggest question, can... Netflix get out of Dahmer what they wanted, which is an American horror story. Runs for 11 seasons, still does pretty decently, um, and people kind of tune in. I think it's a no. It's, it's definitely a no, in my opinion, but I think there's a two-pronged answer. One, Netflix's scheduling means that the longevity of that title has to um, carry enough buzz and carry enough viewership to last longer. If we think about how why American Horror Story kind of works. It's every, you know, it's like eight months, show runs, or sorry, six months, show runs. And then there's six months off, and then it comes back, and they do something else. Also, so that's one. One is like literally just from a programming strategy. You, there's only a certain amount of shows that if you take prolonged amount of time off and then come back for that people might be interested in. Two, although it's also an anthology, and the idea is that, look, they saw what happened with the true crime space, true crime space with podcasts. They saw it happen with their own, their own success, their own documentaries. And now they're seeing it with Dahmer. And so the idea is like, let's double down on it. There's clearly interest in this. The thing that worked with American Horror Story, and I'll compare it to American Crime Story, because I think that's closer to Dahmer. With American Horror Story, it was like subverting genre every season. It was like they subverted, you know, uh, um, supernatural stuff. They subverted the kind of... Um, mentally insane the asylum type stuff you know they subvert teen the campy teen slasher like they found a way to kind of subvert use the same actors to kind of do something really interesting um and build off there and i think that's key to why american horror story works because even though it's the same show every season although feels very ryan murphy feels different enough american crime story which is not as successful as american horror story runs into the issue i think Dahmer runs into it will run into which is like okay people are super into oj that was awesome not super interested in uh, Monica Lewinsky. Definitely not super interested in Johnny Versace. And so there's this viewership that kind of massively declines. And so all of a sudden you're trying to figure out what are people going to be really fascinated by from a true life perspective. And the thing about Dahmer is that Dahmer, of all the serial killers, Dahmer still has this weird hold on American culture where people are like, Jeffrey Dahmer, like he's referenced in Kesha songs. You know what I mean? Like it's it's a thing that it's like people still have this weird connection to Jeffrey Dahmer and they're fascinated by him. Also, Evan Peters has a very, very intense fandom. It's like a weird fandom and they would watch whatever he does, especially him and Ryan Murphy. I think, you, let's say the next season is Ted Bundy. Bundy's overplayed. Like when you do another Ted Bundy thing, you're going to do uh, John Wayne Gacy because they kind of tied in the documentary saw it, viewership. People are not that interested in John Wayne Gacy. Like there's very few serial killers left that you're like, oh, like you, you do Zodiac. Like there's a movie. Fincher already did it. And he did another show that was basically like that on Netflix. Like there's this thing where how do you franchise true crime? in a way that taps into people's obsession with this type of stuff, the way that Dahmer did and the way that this one series really worked. And I think in part because of the Evan Peters, Ryan Murphy situation. And I don't think that works. I don't think it works if you wait too long to do it. And I don't, especially when there's all this serial killer about stuff coming up, like five, six years ago, all these rights were optioned. If people are wondering why there's a bunch of serial killer stuff, five or six years ago, all these things were optioned. Then they went into development. Then they were development held during COVID and now they're out, which is why there's all this serial killer stuff. That's going to go away. New trends will come in. 
And so I don't think Dahmer is going to be this huge, you know, like six, seven season show that does really well. In the same way, and this is my last comparison, because I know I'm rambling, in the same way that I think we're seeing on the film side, all of these studios kind of promising five types of movies and then being like, oh, we can't guarantee interest past the second one. Like, we don't know if we can do this. I think Netflix kind of coming out and saying, like, we're going to build this universe without seeing if people are interested in a second season and then and then maybe a third is getting ahead of itself. And I think it's because they think it's the American Horror Story audience. And I would argue that it's it's not, especially without Evan Peters um, and especially without this kind of, again, Dahmer-esque weird obsession thing that people have. This is a, this is a remarkably dark and vaguely sordid conversation, frankly. I like the, this whole idea of like we're gonna we're gonna try and figure out which are the most popular serial killers. We're gonna make a dark universe <laughs> out of the popular serial. I, the whole thing is very very dark. All right, uh, that was everything I wanted to ask. Uh, I always like to close by asking if there's anything I should have asked. Is there anything you think folks should know about? What's going on in streaming, world of entertainment more broadly, data, et cetera. Uh, what, did, what did I fail to ask? The, I don't think you failed to ask anything. I think you're great. But uh, I, the one thing I'll add, just because it's very, I, literally as we were talking, I got a push notification. I checked my phone because I have ADD. And it was Netflix's testing live programming. And I think we're getting into a moment, which is very fun to me. Um, where if, if anyone is also kind of, and if you're listening to this podcast, I assume you are like media entertainment industry obsessed, we're getting into this moment of like in a very short amount of time, Netflix executives are going to come out and talk about how excited they are about things that two years ago they refute, they said they would refuse to ever do. So they're going to bet on sports leagues and they're going to bring sports leagues, entire leagues, like niche type leagues, kind of what ESPN plus is doing. They're going to bring niche leagues into Netflix. They're going to bring some form of live programming into Netflix. They're going to bring advertising into Netflix. And the thing that I always say to people is that Netflix is going to become, to your point, Sunny, Netflix is going to become a traditional type of entertainment company because without the monopolization that they had that's what they have to do tv has always been advertising advertising is television live programming sports these are things that people are naturally interested in it's what they'll pay for and so i think if anyone is super interested in kind of watching that play out you could literally go back to every earnings call between 2015 and 2019 even early 2020 and have them say no and refuse in like the most like like I this will never happen type way to those three things. And I think in the span of about a year and a half's worth of quarterly earnings calls, you're going to hear them talk about how excited they are to introduce these types of things. And if that's not the perfect Harvard Business School case study of why you never say never, um, I don't know what is. But it is it's it's a moment of of. Uh, I would I would say it's a moment of humility. I think for Netflix, I think I think this moment of we are doing these things because well, we have but to. Why, well, why would it be humility though? I mean, wasn't it was mm-hmm. like I always I see here's here my counter to mm-hmm. that would be I always kind of assumed that whenever whenever a company like Netflix makes a broad pronouncement about what they will or won't do that it's it's whatever they need to say in the mm-hmm. moment i mean i i just i like i i i don't know maybe because i'm a genius i have always i have always thought that like sports are the obvious like mm-hmm. you 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 can't you can never predict what show is going to be a hit or not nobody thought stranger things was going to be an enormous mess squid game nobody was like squid game is going to be viewed by a billion people mm-hmm. For an hour each, like nobody, nobody thought any of that was 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 going to happen. But a thing that you can bet on is the NFL. Like the NFL is going to be a success no matter what network it's on, and we see that with Amazon with Prime. I mean, people signing up for that. So I find I like I've always I've always thought that all of those those were were just what they had to say at the moment because they were focused on a different thing. I, I for the only reason I can I say humility is because I know enough Netflix people within some positions of power that it wasn't like where you know you hear that all the time where people inside warner brothers discovery know they're not going to do something that they're talking about now or they know they're going to change it they are like they already know that but they're to your point have to go out with a certain thing especially in front of investors and shareholders and say like an analyst and say this is the thing we're committed to and that's why our business rides on it and, and we're doing it and at netflix there was this genuine thought that was like why would we do ads like, like that just doesn't make sense. And why would we do that? You know, why would we even look yeah. into sports? And and then things start happening. And I think now what's really interesting about the earnings is there's no like walk back. There's no like, 
we were wrong. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like, like there, there was like, oh, well, actually, it turns out that yeah. this is good. And so I do think between all those things, potentially movies going to theaters, although that's the whole thing because you have to look at the economic. I mean, obviously, Sunny could do this, but the economics of going to theaters for a certain amount of slate and global distribution, whatever it might be. Um, but I think it's interesting to see them kind of say, like, publicly i think advertisements was kind of the breaking thing or the turning point for them and now they can kind of be like we're gonna look into sports we're gonna look like we're gonna do these like we're gonna look into these things and we might not do it but we're gonna look into it yeah uh julia thank you for being back on the show i really appreciate it uh you should be reading our stuff at puck uh if you if you aren't already make sure to sign up for that um what what's your twitter handle tell the p i i don't want to botch it because i will <laughs> at loudmouth julia at Loudmouth Julia, uh, go go follow her on Twitter for however much longer Twitter exists. <laughs> It'll be fun. Uh, and and uh, my name is Sunny Bunch. Uh, uh, I'm the culture editor at the Bulwark, and I will be back next week with another episode. See you guys then. It could be information to change your life forever, or the Something You Should Know podcast could just be something interesting. Ramit Sadi. Talking about being rich. The old definition of rich had a lot to do with how much money you accumulated, but it wasn't about how to spend it. It was more about how to get it. But okay, so once you get it, what do you do with it? In our culture, everybody tells you how to save, but nobody teaches you how to spend it. Something you should know wherever you listen.